West Bengal, and uh, we thought this would be this would be a venture for us where uh, we can develop further. So the challenges uh, which we uh, faced during the project was uh, mainly the contour of the river. The river uh, NW1, that is Hooghly River, it's an alluvial river. So the contour keeps on changing. Every 15 days, what we are finding that the river is changing its shape. There's a vast difference in the depth. The depth which has been projected and given to us uh, as an LED, least available depth of 2.5, that is uh, varying uh, phenomenally from 2.2 uh, meters to 3 meters at times. So these are the two big challenges which uh, we have. And the rivers are not well equipped with uh, navigational aids. The stretch which we are handling is from Sandage to Paraka. It's around 650 kilometers long route we are handling. And uh, there is enough uh, navigational markings on the river which uh, supports continuous or uh, 24 hours operation. Again, uh, another big challenge is the effect of uh, Indo-Bangladesh uh, Water Sharing Treaty, uh, which is uh, there's a sharing between India and Bangladesh. Every uh, 15 day, every 10 days uh, interval, they have to release around uh, uh, 35 million cusack of water to Bangladesh, and subsequently the next 10 days to uh, West Bengal, West Bengal area, India. So this is another effect is there which uh, we think as a challenge we have not faced so far, but uh, this is surely going to be a challenge. Another, the river banks are not paved. There is enormous erosion of the river banks. So these are the few challenges which we see and uh, which we have faced up till now. Thank you. But you know, despite these challenges, you are moving cargo. You are great for the second thing. So obviously, there is there is money at the bottom line. Yes. That's, that's the very reason why you're in this business. So, you know, I, I come I back. Still, I still have to yeah. justify yeah. those two sure. points. Please, please justify. Yeah, no, go, ahead, go ahead and justify. Okay. No, and then perhaps you would, I would like to know from Captain Suridhar, uh, you know, on this shipper issue also, because it was Iksa who piloted that whole report. So, See, when we talk about, when we are not saying that, okay, the major ports, I mean, they should cut down their tariff and like, you know, provide a special status to uh, the coastal operators. I never said that. Because they are also, they have their own compulsions because they have the concession agreement and things like that, revenue sharing and what, what not. I am not asking that. All I am asking is, okay, can we create some alternative? Like the way Kerala government is doing now, they are creating, like all we need is a... Do you really think that Kerala model is going to work 50 paisa per ton? How many people have actually started using it? How many have been spurred into doing it? Then by that same token, the report of which you there are, there are, there are, there are also said no, give it to shippers, no, so why not give it to shippers? No, no, number one, once we have the jetties, see what are we trying to do is, see there are a lot of cargo, uh, let's say which is in hinterland, it's not making its way to the port. Why? Because the first one, see theoretically as a thumb rule, a coastal model will only operate if your uh, first mile and the last mile connectivity is less than 20% or 25% at the most. Okay, what we are doing is by creating some kind of additional loading discharging facility somewhere where you can actually create a facility, you are bringing all those cargo which would normally not get converted into a coastal mode. That's what I'm saying and that is how the first mile and the last mile connectivity can get cut down, more cargo will start flowing towards the coastal mode. So and it will also, and then we don't have to go to Mundra or, uh, I'm not saying Mundra, I'm like, you know, uh, any other uh, private port. Uh, Mundra is still better. Mundra charges are uh, completely okay, but some of the ports are simply uh, untouchable. Well, then the, the the again the fact of the matter is that you know he's despite all these difficulties he runs it, and there is certain cargo that you will be able to carry and certain cargo that you will not be able to carry. For example, if Maruti were to start their movement out of Sanan, I think the whole economics of that movement will change because from Manesar bringing the cargo all the way down into Kandla or Mundra versus from Man uh, Sun and moving into Mundra will be what, one, one and a half hour of travel and will cut down that whole land cost, therefore s gives more money for the sea leg. But uh, Captain Subhidhar, perhaps you can you know talk a little bit about that report which uh, you generated and uh, now this whole unseemingly uh, seeming controversy about whether this should be given to shippers or whether this, this incentive should be given to the uh, operator. Yes, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, let me begin by answering your first opening uh, remark about the policy. I think we have no policy. Forget about industrial policy or any other policy. At the moment, we have no policy. And the policy that has happened, initiative once in a while, which makes the NTPC coal movement possible, is a policy decision. There is, there was a cost saving, there was lots of other benefits. That is why NTPC, located on the Farakabar side of the river, decided to go this route. ICCSA, earlier last year, was asked to commission a report at the end of, a, or during the Coastal Committee deliberations in the Ministry. We believed that this report, commissioned on our behalf by KPMG, would demonstrate median freight difference due to many things, and they demonstrated a 500 rupees per ton median freight difference. And they analyzed that freight difference in all those matters that have been talked about by my colleagues here just now. 35% of that was compliance cost. Indian shipping is so complicated, coastal shipping is more so. That results in 35% of compliance cost. The other 27% came from fuel side. The rest of it came from shipping finance and interest and other ways of acquiring vessels. So the report concluded, because it is a Ministry of Shipping report, we believe that the incentive should have gone to the ship operator, ship owner, because that is why the report was commissioned. Shipper can be incentivized by the government in many other ways, by any other ministry. But why the shipping ministry? We were told that this was an incentive because we have no ships to talk of, to carry the cargo that is already there. And therefore, my submission to the ministry has been that re-look at that report and incentivize the ship owner so that we can acquire more ships and make compliance cost of Indian shipping much lesser than what it is today, which does not impact road and rail in the same manner as it impacts coastal ships. Yeah, that. So, uh, you covered that issue about the ship, shippers also. Uh, I think what we will do is, uh, perhaps Insa would like to, you know, because you have, you have been, you were not part of this uh, report as Insa. Uh, at the same point in time, I think uh, the largest interest of Insa remains on the coast. And I think you are the repository of the you know permissions under 406, 407. Uh, but so I, if you agree, it would be nice if you can you can because the way I see it is that if the shipper gets the incentive, he pays the incentive back into the freight. So finally, it comes back to us as ship owners. Now, do you does Insa share that view? And you know what do you feel uh, needs to be done on the economic side uh, so as to make coastal shipping more sustainable? Thanks, Anil. I think uh, you started off very well by saying whether it has to be a shipping policy or it has to be sort of woven into the national industrial and manufacturing policy. My friend Kevin Subeda rightly mentioned that there is no policy at this point of time, but we are talking about policy which should be formed. Let us say that today's shipper has got getting an advantage from the source what is about 500 rupees per ton or whatever it is. A shipper can get advantage in another way by using green transportation which should be entwined with the production process and tax planning and production assurance is bound to see better results. And what Captain Sumida rightly mentioned that the soft cost of purchase of the ships, it's the rules and regulations which make coastal shipping more expensive, manning which makes it more expensive, bunkers, spares, these are the advantages we get, I think, coastal shipping can take off. Now, what was discussed is whether it is viable or it is not viable. Today, you are carrying only 7% of your cargo by on the coast, on the coast some 53, 54% is by rail, some 35, 38 odd percent is by road. Now, we are not talking about 7% going to 100% or 90% or 20 Like uh, Rappa rightly mentioned the port, that one out of every five. So, let's talk about increasing it from 7 to 15% or 20%. And you are going to work out the port pairs, which are matchable. What cargo, which is cargo origin is near the port, 
or go deliveries near the port. That is the one which is going to be effective. Whichever port comes, I think Gautama mentioned that we've got 200 ports. But if you see the policy which has come, it is just defining about 12, 13 ports which will be able to handle this cargo in the uh, Captain Mohan Committee report. The coastal cargo, 90% of it will go into these 12, 13, 14 ports. Because the other ports, per se, they are ports, but they have no connective outside, neither rail nor road. Now, for the central ports, the ports which have belonged to the government of India, you have rail and road connectivity, your golden quadrangle, this quadrangle takes into uh, account, your railway connectivity is taken care by the central government. What happens to the ports which are in Maharashtra or in Gujarat or in Tamil Nadu and other places? The ports which have come up, was at the right location? Was it required to build a port over there or was it only a political consideration? Because an MP belongs to a particular place, he builds a port over there. I think a thorough techno-economic study, a complete study has to be done. What is the cargo available near that port? What is the connectivity available? How much is the cost going to be for the connectivity? Either the state government or the center or the project proponent has to bring in the connectivity. And then only we talk about coastal cargo. Otherwise, coastal movement has to be, a, it will be a failure, it will be more expensive. But let us assume that it is a failure. Why actually, why have coastal shipping at all? Yeah. Let's put it this way. Let's talk about Europe now. They came with the Marco Polo scheme. Uh, there's a lot of thrust to move this cargo and model, model shift from rail and road to sea. And they talked about some $400 million fund. And it will be incentives which will be given to the people. Apparently, it has picked up. But the model of distribution of this $400 million is not even correct over there. And they are planning to withdraw the scheme so that this money out of this only 10 or 15 percent has been utilized. Every country today thinks of green initiatives. About five years back, there was an Indo Norwegian joint venture group, shipping group was formed. What it was discussed and what it appeared that the entire coastal shipping is going to be on LNG. There will be LNG pumping, fueling stations, every hundred nautical miles will be available. I don't think we have moved even one millimeter further on this. Are we only talking about today? Are we only talking about, are we only looking at the end user and he drives everything? Are we not looking at the national interest? Are we not looking at uh, saving our planet? The green uh, revolution which is to come by this uh, using the fuel? Somebody has got to pay for it. I think there was a very, one comparison which I had mentioned that, you know, we got used to cheaper mode of transport and we are forgetting all other our social responsibilities. I think it's time, time has come to soon. Look at this coastal shipping. All of us know that it's the most economical mode as far as the sea leg is concerned. The land leg has to be planned and that's why it's a pair of ports and the cargo which can be converted from rail and road to sea, only that should be considered. We are not talking about epic cargo. So you are in agreement that we should look, firstly, that there must be an economic argument to move cargo by sea. It must make economic sense. Yes, it, may, it must make economic sense, but if it is inbuilt in the policy. Yeah, no. Like, no, no, that's, no, no it's very to, important. We come to what should be done. I'm just trying to, you know, quickly recap what we need, and then we can all debate what needs to be done. That's right. So the first thing is that it must make economic sense. For it to make economic sense, it must make sense for the operator. It must make, I will even take him as a terminal, because at the end of the day, the maritime authority will get royalty out of the, the thing. So it must make sense for the maritime authority because they must make money, the operators must make money and the users must make money. Yeah, that thing, you have to keep one thing in mind. There's some 66,000 crores budget is provided for the railways. Mm -hmm. Some 50,000 crores budget is provided for the roads. Mm -hmm. There's zero budget for shipping. Yeah. So you take that into the economy and then let's go. So why? Why is it that we, we don't get an allocation to the budget? Perhaps somebody in the, in the audience uh, could answer this. But that's where we started off from, that we don't have a policy. But is the policy the answer, answer sir, to everything? Okay. Let's, let's take a view from, you know, uh, Maharashtra American Board. We, uh, we see GMB having made a huge amount of progress on the 
you know, on the ports and the shipping side. Uh, the Kerala government has recently, in the past one year, been very, very active. They are the first uh, government to come out with this incentive policy. Right or wrong, at least they have shown the determination to move forward. Where does uh, Maharashtra stand? Because uh, at the end of the day, in terms of industrialization, we are perhaps uh, your your state is the is the foremost, and you have a large coast too. So, some thoughts from you, sir, on, on the whole strategy and the vision of MMB. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Harasta <coughs> Maritime Board came in existence in 96. And that was the first time a focused attention was given on the port sector. We undertook survey of the whole coastline and shortlisted some sites, spaced about 50 to 80 kilometers from each other to cover the whole coastline and the hinterland behind it. Based on that policy and the shortlisting of these sites, we started our work and we were able to sign few agreements as early as about 2002 and as late as about 2009. So six agreements we signed for the Greenfield ports of which three have started functioning for a period of time. Some ports have got some uh, difficulties, again policy issues between central state have not made much progress, others have moved forward. Parallel to this, we have allowed smaller facilities in the hinterland area, in the creeks which we have, uh, about eight to nine creeks are well, navigable creeks for up to 30 to 40 kilometers right from the seam of well inside. We have had some industries coming along the waterfront areas. We have been moving cargo from the ship, mother ships to the industries through light rail operations. Thereby, we can say that we have been able to utilize part of the inland waters to the extent of about navigable, navigable lengths of about uh, 20 to 25 kilometers on some, in some areas. There is some thrust to the coastal movement also. We have got uh, some movement from uh, neighboring states uh, in the form of cement which we move from Gujarat to Maharashtra, about almost 2 million tons. We move some uh, clinker from again from Gujarat to Maharashtra. There is machinery which is manufactured in Maharashtra moving by coastal shipping to various states, to Karnataka and even uh, some on the eastern coast. So there is movement as far as uh, cargo is concerned from the coastal shipping as well as inland waterways. Now coming to the movement by coastal shipping, whether we should progress, whether we should support or we should not, I think it is the plain economics which will play the major role. When we speak about policies, whether it should be industrial policy, it should be shipping policy, to my mind it appears that it should be an integrated policy because industry needs shipping to move and shipping is dependent on the industry to survive. So it has to the uh, match between the two policies to uh, to you know take it forward. There was an issue about non-major ports charges. I will only like to say that here are the ports where a private entrepreneur comes. He takes the complete risk. Absolutely no guarantees are given on any account. Whether it is connectivity, whether it is cargo, he has to take the complete risk. So policies which the state government of Maharashtra has adopted allows him autonomy in fixing the tariffs. And that is where some you know claims to say that these are costlier than the government ports because there a private player is not paying. I suppose with the with passage of time when the things settle down. Market, market will control all the rates and they will all be reasonable even for the coastal setting as well as for any other movement. There was a, another issue raised on the subsidy for coastal shipping. There was a move earlier uh, 
government used to give about 30% subsidy towards construction of vessels. We have been uh, recommending that again to the ministry. Hopefully something should come out of it. As far as things about uh, taxation is concerned, I suppose that is more of a uh, central subject and less on the state government subject. The only thing I would like to assure is the people who have dedicated cargo available from point to point and wish to utilize the waterways, we are there to help. We are there to facilitate. That is all at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, one of the important points that was raised was that we don't get an allocation of the budget. You know, INSA raised the 60,000 crores for railways, we get nothing at all. Um, I still uh, think it is unanswered, the point, it's yeah. Not, it's not only allocation of budget. Over the years, the only point that is being made all over the place is the first mile and last mile connectivity. There is no question of the C mile being the cheapest mode of transport for the end user, for the world at large. When they have pumped in so much money in ports, so much money in the railways, so much money on the roads, we have done nothing about the most important part, the first mile and last mile connectivity, and you keep telling us coastal shipping, why do we have coastal shipping? Why do we have Indian flag? This is a question asked in Delhi as well. Why have Indian flag? Services can be purchased from across the world. But if you do not have Indian flag, if you do not have Indian shipping, there are many other disadvantages that the nation would have to face, including the fall of Rupi. So fine, we are agreed that you know there is a strategic interest in having a flag, there is a strategic interest in having your own coastal shipping, your own, uh, 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 your own um, uh, assets for the purposes of movement of uh, cargo on the coast. But at the end of the day, it still doesn't, I don't think we are anywhere nearer to, to answering what is it that we need to do to promote coastal shipping. And you have, you have somebody like MSC who said, you know, who went and invested something in Aropa port. Uh, you have MERS who has been operating here for a very long time. In these past three years, I have seen just one K-Line who decided that they are going to get into Indian coastal shipping because they see, but again, they see sense in moving that cargo along the coast. They see that as an economic opportunity. And finally, don't we all agree that unless it becomes an economic viable opportunity, no one is going to use us as coastal operators. Yes. I, would, I would like to make a point on this. See, when you are talking about the viability from the customer's point of view, See, we've been operating, we've been running the last four years purely in the freight world. I'm not talking about the container which I did earlier. We are regularly getting cargo from a lot many people. I'm talking about their big names in the uh, Indian industry. If it is viable for them, it will be viable for anybody else. The question is, today, what I'm doing is a slow process. Why? Because everybody wants to grab a ready market. How many operators are there? We need to have a proper market mapping. If you do the market mapping and then you, you unearth more and more cargo and it is viable for one, it is viable for other people. It's all across, starting from Gujarat goes all the way to Haldia. There are a number of major players, big players. Why would they consistently move cargo using the coastal mode if it does not make any economic sense for them? But the question is, as I said right in the beginning, we have very few players. There's the, the market mapping or the, uh, 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 the combing of the market the way it should go, that has not been happening. We are doing it in our own limited way. And we also have a certain capacity because we, uh, it's a question of chicken and egg. We can't suddenly put suddenly 20 ships and then like you know, start looking for the Marco. So that is the reason what we are doing is we are gradually exploring, finding more customers, pressing more ships into the service. That is exactly. But I don't take it that, okay, this, it doesn't make economic sense. It definitely makes economic sense. That is why people are doing this business. Let me ask you, therefore, that if finally you are going to get a situation where those who can move are already moving, and therefore, are we saying we have reached a saturation in this market? If there are 650 coastal ships, that's about it. There may be space for a one or two more, and nothing more or less, more than that. Shall we just compare ourselves with Indonesia? I don't like to make comparisons. We got about 850 odd coastal ships. Indonesia has got 10,000 coastal ships. Why? We have to incentivize our coastal shipping. We have to find ways, you know, is it economical? We have to make it economical. We have to find and ways and means to make it economical because it's an easy answer, it's not economical. Let's use other mode of transport. The advantages of 
using coastal shipping have been defined. You are talking, I think we will be repeating the same thing again and again. There is a tremendous scope, A, because if we keep ourselves where we are, there's an, definitely there is going to be an increase in cargo. Last figure I think says there is some, uh, out of 900 million tons, I think 160, 158 million has, of course, the cargo movement has been there last year. There are a lot of, we as in some we keep getting queries for bulk carriers, 50, 55,000 tons of cargo movement. And out of 54 inquiries received last year, in the last six months, 53 have gone to the foreign flag. Again, I'm bringing in cabotage. There's no problem for our owners, Indian owners, to get hold of this coastal cargo. It will all so come why back they, to why level not playing field. This is a question that I'm also asked. Why are they not taking it then? They are not taking it because we need a level playing field. Today we are saying we got roadblocks. Instead of removing the roadblocks, we are removing the road. We are putting a new strip for the foreign lines to come and take away our cargo. This is what you have been doing and now I am following your <laughs> example of going to Delhi every second day, talking to the policy makers, making them understand that give us a level playing field. Today if you are losing 100 crores, if the government feels that the loss to extractor will be 100 crores if we withdraw this facility or if we forego our taxes, they got to see that out of 57 billion dollars of freight which is coming in, which is Indian freight and which 90% goes to the foreign lines and only 6 or 7 billion dollars comes. By increasing the share, if you are able to retain 20% of the freight, you are talking about 10 to 12, 10, 10 to 12 billion dollars more than coming to the Indian economy. So it's got to be a level playing field. We can keep saying, Kam Tiwari mentioned in the morning, 42% additional charges. I think SCI or Mercator or Great Eastern is as competent as MSC to perform. It's only the additional taxes. If they are not paying, why should we? You know, the stage has come, we've got to consider. And government, if they forego these taxes, what is the total gain they're going to have? That has to be worked out. We have all the facts and figures. We need an opportunity. I think we'll have to wait for the next government to come because with this government, I don't think we expect any more now. <laughs> Sir, to the, to the road, to the road and, to the road and uh, rail uh, shipment, you load at least one percent of Solas, Marpol, and IRS. You will start picking viable coastal shipping. See, uh, I mean, you know, these are again these are arguments that we can make, uh, beat our chest here, and then walk out of out of here. The point is that if we can't make an economic argument, it's not going to sustain. You know, you go to planning council, uh, planning commission, you go anywhere in the world. Finally, all of us are in the business of making money, including IRS. Yeah. The, Fact is, the company that you work for, everybody is here to make money. Today, uh, when this conference is also held, somebody standing here is making money out of the conference. So let us not be apologetic about it. The fact at the end of the day is that unless we are able to make an economic argument, either in the long term for a macro larger benefit to the nation because of your strategy, then if we are not able to make it, it is but natural that the government will gravitate towards a situation where they said that we will relax cabotage for a period of five years or six years or four years in order that you can, you know, attract more cargo, create more cargo and then perhaps the way they see it is that some Indian ship can come in and start participating in that business also. So, you know, the, uh, I think we have to, and that is why I would have been happy if, you know, CSLA was, was sitting here, somebody from CSLA was sitting here because it is my firm view that regardless of whatever we can say, and I am an emotional Indian ship owner, my, I, my whole my all my life and sitting here is because of Indian ship owning. But the fact is that if you can't give an economic argument, you can't take yourself forward anyway. And I think I would think as INSA, you are perhaps most strongly placed to make that economic argument, which was what INSA also did. You know, when we Saza will bear us out when we did those reports with uh, with. Um, with Delhi, Terry, you know, we got them to make a report, we got SBI to make reports. I think unless you make these economic arguments and then use chambers like Bombay Chamber who are able to then put forward those economic arguments, then do you think you stand a chance of convincing somebody in the government that out of that 60,000 uh, crores of that is given to the government, maybe some 30,000 crores or 20,000 crores could be given to shipping? Sir. Anil, can I just... Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, and this is meant to I'm irritate actually, you, you know. No, no, thank you very much. Yeah, I love but, to be irritated on this yeah. and uh, I am enjoying it. Uh, just about 15 days back, there was another conference and where I mentioned this point, I'll, the cost of repeating I'll once again mention. 
what is what do you mean by economic sense internationally economic competency let's take example of now all of us are used to paying bombay to delhi fare of aviation sector where your 100% cab fare is you verily pay 10000 rupees one way fare every day and you are very happy about it because you do not have an option available please open up this sector air asia will come tomorrow he'll offer you bombay delhi for 3500 rupees all our people will get you sweat that is what is making economic sense but ajit that's, singh does not open it up see the point is he is not opening up whereas our ministry is ready to open so it up so why is it that ajit singh is not opening it up if we can touch that point that why is ajit singh not opening it up why is the ministry of civil aviation not allowing a foreign airline to operate coast coast i am not coast but if you are not coast i think that is where lies the answer in fact by the month of june we can have this argument with our new government and the minister well we don't know you know new government old government uh, we don't know whether active people but anyway uh, you know these these debates can can uh, uh, can go on i i think i uh, you know having having heard that you know msc and uh, you know co companies like mers etc who have been operating in india uh, it could be useful to get get an external perspective on what those companies think of when they look at the coastal trade and i'm going to ask you captain tiwari uh, you know not only as the chairman of csla but also as uh, somebody who leads msc here in this region to tell us what what do you see as an outsider's perspective please don't wear your sci hat and your you know uh, but what what does it what does it mean for an msc if they have to you know look at india and get into a participate into coastal shipping in, in india um may i just say that uh, the competencies are the same and that's the reason why sci partners us uh in services from india to europe on the international trade where they are as competitive as this, any other line okay is the issue will the the issue comes of flag you see when they when they partner us I mean, frankly, flag is not an issue. It's really not an issue. We are working with SCI now for for a few years. The flag has never been an issue. But the moment we come into Navasheva and then want to go to Mundra or we want to go from Navasheva to Chennai, the flag becomes an issue for the same cargo, foreign cargo, exim cargo. That there lies the problem. but that is and, and and that is, I'm, I'm sorry that is what we uh, we as foreign operators cannot understand if i have a uh, if i have a destination delivery to chennai and my ship calls at valarpadam for instance right don't i uh, expect the right to take it in an economical way from valarpadam and deliver it to the consignee indian consignee in chennai completely and that's but therefore the The question I am asking you, Karol, is that does you, if your vessel was therefore an Indian flag, would it make it difficult for you to move that cargo from Bala Padan to somewhere else? If that it was, was if it was an Indian flag, then the leg from uh, Bala Padan to Chennai would be at a at a cost which is much higher than my international cost. So even as a as, so so as, the point is yes. the point is how we see it is that. one way is the government of india till such time as they make the policy to give a level playing field to the indian flag allow the foreign uh, foreign flag to operate and we are not talking of domestic cargo we are not talking of domestic cargo we are not talking of the cement that is produced in gujarat and is being imported into uh, mumbai we are not going to participate in that even if it comes in containers what we are talking about is the exim cargo that originates in uh,